Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, Data Transferability and Data Collection Webinar. Good morning, or I guess for most of you, good afternoon. Um, this is Andrea Copping with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in, the, uh, in Seattle. And I have with, here with me my colleague, Michaela Freeman. Do you want to say hi, Michaela? Hi, this is Michaela Freeman. You guys have probably received all the emails from me, um, and I'm here joining with Andrea. Thanks. So um, I'm very pleased to have you join us today. And um, what we're going to do today is um, talk about data transferability, starting out with what do we mean by this? What do we mean by data collection consistency? And also what we hope to get out of today. Um, you see a little uh, agenda, if you will, for the workshop. Want to talk about the purpose introduce some topics, and we're going to spend most of the time showing you some data sets and information and explore some of that around some of the interactions uh, for marine renewables. Uh, we want to sort of towards the end introduce you to a data transferability framework that we have developed and really get your feedback. And I stress that what we're about today is we want to provide you some information, but we really want to get your feedback. We want to know what you think of it. Is, is something adequate? Is it interesting? Is it irrelevant? It would be really useful for us to know these things. And in order to do that, to be honest, we'd like to be there with you, all of you in person, but we know how difficult that is for everyone's travel. So we are going to be putting a set of questions up on a slide, um, and any input you have, we'd just love to hear. Um, uh, and uh, you also, for those of you that received information directly from Michaela, you received the same questions on a little sort of a worksheet. We will also follow up with exactly the same questions with an online survey later. And we're doing this really just to provide the easiest way for you to give us feedback. So, okay, um, so just to give you a little bit of background here, who, who are we and what are we doing here? Um, both Michaela and I work for Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is one of the Department of Energy's national labs. We are fortunate enough to be the only national lab that has a marine station out here in the West Coast. So we do take the lead on a lot of these sort of environmental interactions between devices and the ocean, the animals, the habitats, et cetera. Um, this particular program is working directly for the Department of um, Energy's Water Power Technology Office, who have responsibility for marine renewables, also for hydropower. Um, you'll hear the, them refer to it often as MHK or marine hydrokinetics. Um, internationally, it's generally referred to as marine renewable energy or MRE, and we'll tend to use that throughout this presentation. Um, offshore wind is dealt with differently or separately by the Department of Energy. I also work on those programs, and especially as we have people interested in uh, offshore wind permitting, Although most of our examples draw from wave and tidal energy, there is a lot of crossover, and I will try to note that where possible, and let's, let's discuss it. So what we're doing here today is representing an international program under the International Energy Agency's collaboration of nations called Ocean Energy Systems. And under OES, there are a number of tasks or annexes. The Annex 4, led by the U.S., deals with examining environmental effects of marine renewables. There's right now 12 countries participating in Annex 4, and the big push we're making this year is in this so-called data transferability and collection consistency, and that's really what this is all a part of. So how did we get here? Why are we doing this? Well, for, in terms of background, we hear from the marine renewables industry that they perceive that it takes a long time to get projects in the water, that permitting is long and complicated, they're asked to provide extensive baseline or pre-installation data, and also that post-installation monitoring requests can be quite extensive. They're also very worried that mitigation um, requirements may be looming on the horizon as well. So there's a lot of sort of uncertainty and, and sort of malaise. And it is our perception, not telling you your jobs, but our perception is that there's still a lot of challenges facing the regulatory community. We don't have very many deployed devices anywhere in the world. These are new technologies. They really, we, we have a lot of uncertainty around environmental effects. 
we know that you're mandated to protect the marine environment and to follow state and federal uh, regulations, laws, et cetera. And on top of that, you have to make decisions when you get applications on these projects. So we really see this as an overall, you know, tough situation where we think additional information, additional coming together on that information could help everyone. So that's why we're here. Um, and most, probably most of all, we really believe that we have to learn as we go. And that's where being part of an, inter an international project is really nice because there's things going on in other countries we can learn from and vice versa. Okay, so where, where we're coming from is our hypothesis is that data and information that is collected through ongoing projects should be able to be used to inform new projects. We recognize that every new project proposed needs some site-specific data collection, but we think that by really learning and bringing together information from early projects, we can probably reduce the amount of site-specific data collection that's needed for each new project. It'll never go away, but it could be reduced. We also know that there's a great deal of learning that could come from other industries that this sort of transfer of information from one industry to another could be helpful. In some cases, it's not all analogous, but in others it is. So that's really where we're coming from here. So, so just a few definitions before we go too far down the road. We are talking about mostly wave and tidal development, um, although, as I mentioned, there's a lot of crossover with offshore wind. But when people are talking marine renewable energy, it also includes, although you're not seeing too many applications yet, um, uh, the potential for harvesting power from ocean currents, like the Gulf Stream and the Kurashio uh, River current, uh, ocean thermal energy conversion, which is, you know, that, that differential energy from the temperature of warm surface water to deep cold water, much more uh, uh, topical in the tropics, of course and also salinity gradients. And we're also already seeing building, buildings, excuse me, being cooled uh, with salinity gradient power in Scandinavia. So these things are, are quite real. Some of them are just further along than others. And many of you may be familiar with TSIS. If you're not, there's a lot of information there. This is our online knowledge management system. There's the URL. And I know some of you on the phone know it well. Others, I don't know. But um, I think you can find a lot of information there. Okay, so down to the nitty-gritty. What do we mean when we see, say, data in terms of data transferability, data collection? What we really mean is data and information. It could be raw or quality control data that would come to you as a regulator, but it's more likely to be analyzed data, synthesized data that's brought together to reach some conclusion, reports, et cetera. So although we use the term data, we're not necessarily talking about tabular data or, or you know, ones and zeros and, and uh, uh, ge geographic data. We may be. Okay, so today what we want to do is just walk through some of the types of information that represent some of the major interactions of concern. Now these are the ones that we are seeing slowing permitting in other parts of the world and as well as here in the U.S. The ones we've picked we think are the real tip of the iceberg, which is, no, that's the wrong analogy, the tip of the spear, maybe. Uh -huh. um, collision risk, which really pertains to tidal energy largely. Uh, the effect of underwater noise, which is both a wave and a tidal issue. Electromagnetic field effects, um, uh, largely cables, but can also be from devices. Changes in habitats and changes to physical systems, meaning changes in circulation or perhaps wave height, wave power, et cetera. And then, as I said, we're going to present our framework on what we think might work for data transferability and really try to get your thoughts on all these. And we're going to start to talk about the information associated with collision risk for marine renewable energy devices. Now, this does largely pertain to tidal energy, and I know we have some on the phone for whom this is very pertinent, others not so much. Um, I do want to note that the information I'm showing you is not just our data by any stretch of the imagination, but we have borrowed data with permission from a number of our colleagues which are noted on each of the introductory slides, such as here. Okay. Um, so. Uh, collision risk, what is the issue? It's really the concern of rotating blades perhaps causing injury or death to animals, most commonly marine mammals, fish, diving seabirds, could be sea turtles in the right environments, 
et cetera. Um, and the reason we care, generally speaking, is because of potential effects on populations, although clearly what we look for is effects on individuals. The, here we don't really have good analogs from other industries because hydropower turbines turn much faster. They're, they're the only escapes through a dam. They really don't pertain, uh, don't give us an awful lot of insight into what's likely to happen around um, in-stream tidal turbines. Ship propellers, similarly, are putting out a lot more energy into the water. They're moving much faster, and they allow a ship to move laterally a lot faster than many animals can respond to. So although they look on the surface sort of similar, they're really not very analogous. They don't inform us much. And we know that animals might come into close proximity to a turbine just sort of un unwittingly in normal movements. They might even be attracted for shelter or feeding purposes and they might simply not be able to avoid the device. And this is really dependent on how strong the animal is, you know, fish versus marine mammals, and so on. So what I'm going to show you, because I know in this country, without much deployment, we don't have a lot of information. And what you're seeing here is video underwater on the voice turbine when it was um, I'm sorry, the Andrus turbine. This is in Pentland Firth. This is part of the first commercial array of tidal turbines in the world. There you see the uh, device out of the water, and you see two of the four turbine, uh, cameras focused on the turbine are operating. This is the, the shallowest turbine, which is actually which the one the camera's on, is at 35 meters, and they're building out to somewhat deeper. You see about an eight meter blade, and you see how slowly it is turning. And that's probably the biggest point there is to understand these are not very fast moving devices. Another turbine up also in northern Scotland, this is the voice turbine that was deployed at the European Marine Energy Center, EMEC. It is at about, also at about 35 meters. And I think the real point here is you can see some of the fouling on the, in the upper right camera. In the upper left camera, you see all these fish in the proximity of the blade. They're small fish, but they're clearly pretty unperturbed by the, by the turbine. This is a slightly smaller turbine than the, um, you know, the previous one. So that's the kind of video that we get underwater to just give a sense of what's going on. Now we have uh, in the U.S. the ORPC, um, Ocean Renewable Power Company Rivgen Turbine. You see in the upper right a, a picture of it. This was deployed, it's out of the water now, but it was in for two parts of two summers up on the Kvijak River outside Igiagig, Alaska. It's smaller than the other turbines and it's a different design, the cross-flow turbine. And it's on that barge there and then it can be lowered into the water. And the very grainy video you see is the turbine not turning. It's, it's a poor system, and I think a uh, camera system, but you can clearly pick out some fish. This is just looping. You can kind of see it going around. I mean, the, the, the video repeating. Um, this also gives us some indication that you have to choose your instruments fairly wise, wisely. We uh, had this uh, very large video data set come to us for analysis. And what they used was a series of um, sort of low-cost security cameras underwater, and there were a lot of issues. So um, we, we've learned some things about that. Um, the second one, uh, during this one, the turbine is turning, and you will also see fish coming through. And again, it's terribly difficult to tell how close they were to the turbine. Um, what we do know is we didn't see fish parts on the other side of the turbine at all. So we have a pretty good indication the animals are going through the turbine or around the turbine without harm. And that's one of the real challenges with um, this collision risk, is being able to really get a good sense of what's going on near, nearby. Now, this is uh, just showing you a deployment, not of a turbine, but this is the um, uh, adaptable monitoring platform put together by the University of Washington, PMAC, for uh, putting together a series of instruments. And the important part here, I think, is that we have so far learned there's not probably one good instrument that will really show us what's going on with um, collision risk. We're just getting a little view from the, the divers giving us a, the inside of this um, uh, piece of equipment. And what it consists of is several different sonars, or different echo sounders, and also a video camera. 
And the idea here is that you start with the cruder instrument. There's also passive acoustics on here in case there were vocalizing marine mammals that would alert um, the system to bring on the wider view of acoustic, uh, uh, active acoustic sonar to determine there was a target coming in, which could then hand off to a more, a narrower view, but much more targeted acoustic camera. And finally, if an animal comes close enough, trigger a video uh, camera. So that's kind of the, the, the purpose going on here. And if we think of this as sort of being, it's not a turbine, but think of it as being a turbine that an animal's coming in towards. And what you're going to see here is we are targeting a tracking a seal. And that red line is drawn just to show you the seal. This is a, um, a multi-beam sonar, one of the sort of wide beam uh, sonars. So we saw the seal come across that track. As we move to, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, this is the same instrument, and what we see here is a um, school of fish come across. And you saw the light bulb go on and the fish start to scatter as the bulb came on. I think we I play again, let's just see. Oh, it's still playing again. Here come the fish again. And so you see that you can, you can see that target, but you still have to kind of take a guess that it's fish. In this next one we're using, um, what you see is some fish, some targets, and then a bigger target coming in. And we've determined this is a seal coming in grabbing a fish. So that, those are pretty nice pieces of data. And you can kind of get a sense from the animals in the area what's likely happening. But it's not always that clear. And in some cases, how would you know that was a, uh, that was a seal? It just looks like a blob. So in this case, because it was in a controlled environment in the bay of our, our um, uh, laboratory, what you see on the left is from the multi-beam sonar, you see in the left-hand box that blob that was near the, near the uh, cameras. And then in the upper right part of that left-hand one, there is a uh, still image that was taken, was triggered by this multi-beam sonar, and that tells you it's a seal. On the right-hand scan, there's this, another blob in there, in the red, um, noted in the red box. And it, does, it doesn't exactly look like the seal, but it doesn't look that different. But in taking a video still, what we saw was that was a diving bird. And the reason that that image looked almost as large as the seals is because that animal entrained air in its feathers as it dove. So here's the instance where having two different technologies, the acoustic sonar and also the um, video camera, really makes a difference. So that's the kind of data that we're collecting for uh, collision at this point. And showing you just those clips, I'd, I'd really be interested to know if anyone has thoughts about what these data tell you. Um, do you think any of this is applicable and useful? for your understanding and might help you as you had an application come forward and so on. I'm going to go on and talk about underwater noise. Okay, um, uh, I think we all know why we're concerned about underwater noise. We know that uh, marine animals use uh, sound the way many uh, terrestrial animals and humans use light for sight, that this is so uh, key to their communication navigation. There's also potential uh, actual physical harm to animals from loud sounds underwater. Um, but if we are talking here largely about operational noise, installation, especially if you think that think about bottom-based uh, uh, wind turbines, uh, offshore wind turbines, we think this is a, a different issue altogether and needs to be dealt with separately. But we're focused especially on this continuous operational noise. Now, we know that shipping and other industries that are occurring in um, the marine environment, we've measured them. When you're out next to a, a tidal or wave device, um, that the shipping and other noises are much, much higher. They may not be continuous, but they're much higher um, uh, uh, amplitude. We overall think that the underwater noise from wave or tidal devices is unlikely to cause harm to marine animals, and I'll show you some, what we think is some evidence of that. Um, as far as offshore wind goes, there's been very little done in terms of we, we measure the sound from wind turbines in air, but exactly how that manifests in the marine environment. The, excuse me, the very few measurements that people have tried to make have not been overly successful, partly. Um, there was work done around the first principal power wind float off Portugal, 
where they tried to measure the noise of the turbine in the water um, at a, a little bit of a standoff from the device. And what they found, of course, is there wasn't much sound from the turbine until the wind picked up and it started to really move faster, at which point the sound of the wind and the waves pick up, and it was really pretty impossible to tell. We have done some modeling using what we can um, of sort of uh, what the Navy considers sort of a rule of thumb of about 10 percent of noise generated in air penetrating the air-water interface. And if that is really holds up, the sound from these turbines, uh, wind turbines generated underwater is really quite low. But some measurements need, are needed. Don't adjust your set. You should be hearing a hum. And I'm going to turn that down a little because it's annoying. Um, this is the sound of the open hydro turbine. It was measured underwater. Of course, I'm playing it back in air, and the amplitude of that is really based on how much we boost the signal, how much you turn the sound up on your machine, et cetera. But we measured this, and we actually used it to challenge fish in the laboratory to see how they reacted to it. There you see the, the, um, uh, the, uh, on the y-axis is the amplitude, the decibels over the frequency spectrum of that particular turbine. Again, this was deployed up at uh, EMEC. That's the turbine in the upper right. That's their research frame. The turbine gets winched down underwater. That's just so they can swap it out and so on. It doesn't look like that uh, ordinarily. It would be on the seabed. Um, and what you see probably notably is that we do, we're not seeing any peaks much over 130 decibels. Most shipping noise is in the sort of 150 and up sound, um, but that's one particular turbine that we have measured. If we look at some wave devices, this uh, video is actually of the Azura wave device, which is deployed at the uh, Wave Energy Test Center off Kineoe Bay in the island of Oahu, Hawaii. And if you see that big sort of bell-like thing, it's how that uh, that body moves with the waves that generates the power. You can sort of see the movement above and below water. And again, we've been able to take some sound spectra from that. Um, you're looking at something a little different, more differently here. The x-axis is time, so this is a 30-second clip, and the y-axis is the frequency. Um, the sound is shown in the quietest sounds are black, all the way up through the, the higher sound levels are um, uh, yellow, uh, orange to yellow. And so what you're really seeing is the frequency as it changes over time. We'll just take a look at this one little slice around uh, 9 to 11 seconds where you see a bunch of those striations, which remember are higher sound. And this is what that spectrum looks like. We're back to the decibels on the, the amplitude on the y-axis and frequency over the x-axis. And we think the power takeoff un, um, uh, unit, the PTO, is around that 300 to 1200 hertz range. Because remember, with these animals hearing underwater, it's not only the overall sound, but it's the frequency that matters. And I'm going to play you an audio clip here, again, that I hope you can hear. That's just playing over and over. And that is that clip through that those frequencies. And you see here, I, I'll play it one more time and listen for the snaps if you can. This is just a feature of Hawaiian waters, the snapping shrimp. They do this with a couple of parts of their carapace uh, uh, rubbing together. And I think this is a key point in measuring sound of these devices underwater. What are we really hearing? Those lower frequency sounds, the so-called flow noise, is not real noise. It's so-called pseudo noise. Think about riding a bicycle uh, with a helmet on down a hill and you hear that sound. That is not propagating sound. It is just air going across, in that case, your ear or the listening device. So we do think we're measuring the actual output from the device in that sort of center part. Uh, the gray line is the manufacturer's um, 
uh, proposed or uh, believed um, output, and the blue line is what was actually measured um, a few meters off the device. The lighter blue is the 95% confidence interval. So you see it's kind of what the uh, manufacturer thinks. But again, I would note what the decibel levels are, and with the exception of that slow noise, not real noise, they do tend to stay below 100 uh, dB. And here's one more. This is the Fred Olson Lifesaver device. It is a toroid, a donut, uh, that has a pretty shallow draft, and those little humps on it are essentially oscillating water columns where there is a chamber with the wave comes up and compresses air that comes out through a, a, uh, an air turbine. And again, we've listened to the sound of this. This is the same sort of thing you saw before. The dark areas are low uh, amplitude sounds. We're seeing a 30 second clip and the frequency, uh, the frequency up over the, going up, uh, up the Y axis. And this time we're gonna look at this little uh, piece of it at about 23 to 25 seconds. So see if you can hear this one. So that, again, we believe is the sound of the PTO, but it has that annoying little sound to it. Let me play it one more time. That is what we think is what the PTO sounds like. I'm picking another spot here in the sort of eight to nine or seven to nine second range. I think you can hear that one is that, oh, stop, stop. that one, that squeak is a damaged bearing in the PTO. And what's important about this is the developer does not want to have a damaged bearing or other non-fully functional parts. So that measuring the acoustic output of these devices will become a very common part of what the developer measures to measure the health of this device. So here's an opportunity to really monitor what the sound output is for the animals at the same time that the um, developer is already uh, taking these data. So we think this is a, an important aspect of working with the developer to understand what data they would already uh, reasonably collect for other purposes and see where the environmental data can either be derived from, added to, or perhaps with a little modification of the health monitoring plan can be, uh, can be achieved. Because nobody wants a damage bearing, either the sound levels or the, um, for the uh, environment or for the health of the device. But again, I will note that these are pretty much, these peaks are still pretty much staying below 100 decibels. So why is this important? Well, I think you're probably aware that NOAA has redone their technical guidance for um, uh, uh, thresholds auditory thresholds, audio thresholds for uh, fish and marine mammals. Um, they've become a great deal more complicated. If any of you have worked with them, you'll know that. Um, and divided for different types of cetaceans and also pinnipeds. But I would like to note that in all cases, either impulsive sound or non-impulsive sound, the impulsive sound relating particularly to things like pile driving, those decibel uh, levels are really all pretty much higher than what we're measuring on either uh, wave devices or that single turbine we've measured. So I think the important thing here is we need to get measurements from more devices. And I could hopefully see in the future where as regulators you might tell a developer they need to provide this audiogram, this um, auditory output of their device over certain frequency levels at certain distance from the device. And from that, get a good sense of whether there's likely to be um, harassment or injury to either fish or marine mammals. Um, so I, I think this might actually be a path forward, we're hope, hopefully. Now this somewhat fuzzy slide, just to sort of remind us that across the, fr the frequency range in which these devices operate, 
there is somebody hearing this underwater um, at all at, across any frequency. And similarly, we have many of these other kinds of human activities from shipping to sonar to seismic surveys, fisheries work and so on that take in these same areas. So it's a very messy, noisy landscape out there. But trying to understand what these uh, marine renewable devices might contribute is pretty important. Uh, this extra slide is just to kind of remind you um, what kind of noise comes out of shipping. This is three different uh, types of ships, con a container, a bulk carrier, and uh, sort of a tanker type of operation. And seeing what those kinds of frequencies look like and also that the, um, the amplitudes tend to be considerably higher than we're measuring at the moment in these uh, devices. So that's what I have to show you in the acoustic, underwater acoustics effects. And again, the same questions, what, uh, what does this tell you? How useful is this kind of data to you in uh, reviewing applications in your sort of thinking about this interaction? And what else would you feel you needed to see or hear? So if there's nothing else on noise, we'll go on and talk about EMF. Um, I'm not going to show you EMF data because for most of us it doesn't mean an awful lot. but. I want to show you some of the results of some of the studies that have been done because there's been a, quite a bit of effort put into this, particularly by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, the DOE and others. I think partly because a lot of us think this is an issue we should be able to wrestle to the ground, whereas the previous two are so pretty tough. I think you all know why we worry about EMF. We know that there's certain um, uh, animals that are sensitive, certain marine animals, not all of them are. They have to have the right receptors. We tend to see elasmobranchs and crustaceans in particular. There are thoughts that maybe marine mammals and sea turtles and some fish species, although that is mostly pretty anecdotal. We know some of them seem to recognize the Earth's magnetic field, but it's still not clear they have the right kind of receptors for these kinds of, of signals. Um, we also know that EMF signatures come from a whole variety of things, cables, but also large uh, conglomerations of metal like bridges and so on will give off EMF signatures. And at the moment, we know some of these EMF sensitive species can be attracted or they may avoid sources. Um, currently, we're not seeing any actual harm, which is, of course, another one of those cause and effect things very hard to wrestle to the ground. This is just uh, to give you a little reminder that um, cables putting out EMF come in many shapes and sizes. How big they are matters. If they're um, alternating current or direct current, it really affects what kind of signal they put out. And to remind you that EMF deals very differently in seawater than it does in air or fresh water. And that's because when you put out a, an electromagnetic signal, the E field, the electric field, shorts out very quickly in seawater. You're left with a magnetic field and then an induced electric field. So the, um, although we have modified some um, models from uh, looking at EMF in air and uh, uh, soil, um, there are modifications needed. It's not identical, but we do have a fair sense of this. Um, some, there's been extensive literature sort of uh, a review done to look at what we do know. Um, and uh, Boehm several years ago had Norma Doe put together a very large volume of this. And one of the big outcomes from it is that we know that we can effectively model these cables. We need to know a few things. What does the cable look like? Will it be buried? And if so, how deep? Um, and some other um, aspects of it, including the, the electrical load. What we don't know is how animals react. We know the behavioral responses, but only for a few species. There was a number of laboratory studies done, a lot done in our lab, actually, to really try to challenge some marine animals to EMF to see what we could learn. And we used quite a high EMF level, about three um, millitesos. And we tested a variety of uh, crustaceans and fish. We looked at both behavioral changes and physiological developmental changes. For example, we raised um, Atlantic and Pacific halibut from eggs. Uh, with and without EMF, and we found, um, I think it's the Atlantics had some uh, developmental delays up to larvae, but very quickly caught up with their control brethren after that. So, uh, and then we had a number of other fish. We tried to work with salmon and EMF, 
but the salmon were so spooky, we really couldn't, uh, in the laboratory setting, get a very good sense of whether they knew or cared about the uh, EMF signal. Crab, Dungeness crabs certainly were aware it's there, and they do a little flicking of these antennules to tell us that. These are, we modified a number of um, methods from uh, 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 contaminant uh, research so that they, we knew they were picking up the signals. We also worked with American Lobster. And what we found with the crab and lobster in particular was they were very aware of the signals. They took note. Uh, the crabs carried on as they did. The, the uh, lobsters ran off a bit and burrowed. But by the second day of exposure, they went about their business with no recognition whatsoever so or no perturbation. So, Again, these behavioral kinds of studies, very difficult, but we didn't really see anything that could be considered deleterious, but it's a long way to go to prove that, quite frankly. In terms of field studies, there's been quite a number done. The sort of the, the, the first really important one was done by Andrew Gill in the UK as part of CALRI, which was the big push for research and the environment prior to the first offshore wind rounds in the UK. And what Gill and his colleagues did was put big cages upside down on the seabed um, uh, with uh, electrical cables running through them, and so they could all de-energize and de-energize the cables. And what they found was that cat sharks, which we would call dogfish, um, certainly recognized it, but didn't seem to have any ill effects or positive effects. Some of the skates responded, but, you know, again, no one really could see that there was any damage done. There was a, uh, around that same time, Westerberg and Langenfeld put acoustic tags in um, European eels and had them swim back and forth across a cabled area. And again, it was clear they noted the cable, and they had these acoustic tags allowed them to look at quite small movements of the eels. So they noted the cables, but they kept going. They didn't, weren't kept from a habitat, and it was quite a small effect. Um, Boehm, uh, took on a uh, field project in Southern California Bight where they looked at energized cables going out to some of the oil rigs in the Santa Barbara Channel. They looked at both an energized and a de-energized cable and um, examined to see if various fish species would uh, react. And what they found was there really didn't seem to be very much response. Of course, many field programs, as you know, it's very difficult to tell what's within the natural variability of animal behavior. One of the other things they were able to do, though, is get some nice uh, field information to validate some of the EMF modeling efforts. Other studies, very nice study in Europe, Marvin, where they looked at the electrical output, uh, the electrical and magnetic output from a wind farm in the North Sea. And they were, in fact, measuring the output in air from the turbines themselves, which they found to be quite small compared to the cables. And the cable going to shore, the bigger cable, had more EMF coming out of it than the ones between the turbines, not unsurprisingly. Um, they really don't know if these are biologically relevant, but they are measurable sorts of um, signals. I would like to note that these are unburied cables. They not necessarily routinely bury cables in Europe. So that gives you some indication what you may want be wanting. Some other ongoing studies, uh, some of them Boehm fund them, some of them by others, that have not yet reported out. There was some work done on an HV high voltage DC cable in Long Island Sound with uh, enclosures with um, uh, lobster and skates and various other animals. And they're really trying to look at the fine scale movement. Again, this issue, our animals repulsed by, uh, intrigued by, willing to cross, et cetera, these cables. Um, another couple of studies that Boehm uh, sponsored uh, in the Santa Barbara Channel with red rock crab and Dungeness crab in Puget Sound, they used a series of these big sort of crab traps and baited different ends of them, placing them, as you can see from that diagram on the right, different sides of the cable, with the idea if you put the crab in one end, would it just head for the bait or would it be put off by the uh, electromagnetic signal, and what they found even with two different um, sizes of cable uh, carrying different amounts of electricity, what they found was the um, uh, animals are really not um, unwilling to cross either a buried cable or a cable uh, that runs through one of these cages. So again, no clear, you know, deleterious effect. 
And then this last one I wanted to show you, I thought was a really wonderful study, but one never knows. There's a uh, high voltage DC cable running through San Francisco Bay, and questions have arisen about migratory fish, particularly some salmon smolts and steelhead smolts and green and white sturgeon. And as you know, a number of these fish are listed. Um, they tagged the fish and they carried out a magnetometer survey throughout the, the uh, bay trying to really understand whether these um, animals would be willing to cross the uh, cable. Unfortunately, the outcome was, in many cases, they couldn't pick up the cable with the magnetometer. And this is due to the very large additional magnetic sources in the bay, uh, bridges, other kinds of infrastructure. The fish did not appear to care one way or another. They were moving about their, their migratory business. But this does sort of raise the, the difficulty of perhaps um, parsing out a signature from a cable or a device uh, when there are many of these other kinds of signatures. But the good news is the animals did not appear to uh, be unwilling to cross this barrier or any other. So that's just a quick whip through many of the EMF studies that have gone on and where there are reports out, they're all up on TSIS and we'll get that one from Mary that's just come out, so that's good news. Um, I would like to know what you think, how concerned you have been about EMF, uh, whether these studies help with that concern, what else would you like to see as far as um, EMF as a, as a concern would go? Okay, well in that case, let's talk about habitat changes. Um, and I wanna talk about benthic habitat largely, but habitat changes can also include things that are going on in the water column. So the reason we, we might be concerned from this industry is clearly there's devices and parts of devices, anchor lines and cables that are gonna be on the seafloor and also in the water column. And anything you put in the environment is altering the habitat somewhat. The question is, does it matter? And if you do change habitat, obviously you can change some behavior, some areas where animals may or may not inhabit. The real concern is, are you really modifying or eliminating species for, from important habitats? Are you changing their, their way of life, particularly for listed species? Um, What's useful here for the marine renewable energy industry, offshore, including offshore wind, is we know that there are analogs in other industries. There's nothing very new or startling or different about putting these things in the ocean from many other things, from anchoring buoys, from building docks, et cetera. And we think that the real answer here is it's like real estate, location, location, location. If you have a rare or important habitat, don't put your device down on top of it. Don't anchor on the one rocky reef in an expanse of soft habitat. So it's really about sighting. Um, just to give you some sort of sense, uh, this is actually West Coast. This is off Newport, Oregon, the Pacific Marine Energy Center off um, uh, Oregon State Universities. And this is just some um, underwater video taken from a dredge. Um, at about 50 meters deep. Now, on the west coast, we have, of course, a very narrow shelf, um, and, but much of it is this soft bottom habitat, and I think you'll find that's the case as you get a little ways out in the Atlantic, although obviously you have a much more extensive shelf. And we see literally hundreds to thousands of square miles that is very similar habitat to this. So once again, if you have a good benthic um, survey, which one would require of a developer, I would certainly assume, um, you can get a, get a good sense of where to place and where not to place devices. This is just going a little further north off the Washington coast, off um, Grays Harbor, a little bit deeper, and again, you see the soft bottom habitat. There's definitely marine life out there, but it, there's very little that is rare. Um, we have some deep water corals and deep water um, sponges off the northwest coast, and we're just beginning to discover those that are a little deeper than this, and the key is simply to avoid them. So that's, that's kind of how we've looked at this. If you look in a, <coughs> a tidal environment, this is underwater video taken in Admiralty Inlet within Puget Sound, um, and in this case, it's rocky uh, cobble. 
Uh, there's definitely stuff living down there. It's, it's the, the visibility is not great, of course, because of the fast moving water. But you see it's not a terribly rich habitat simply because of the very fast moving water on tidal sites. And this tends to be the case where you have tidal energy capability. Um, there are a few areas I know in the UK they are more worried about sand banks because they tend to put tidal devices in much shallower water than we've considered. Um, but in, on the whole, you tend to get rocky bottom. And uh, that's really it. That's all I've got to show you there. Um, I think the key issue here is what do we already know about habitat changes? There is a, a cadre of my fellow researchers who are terribly interested in looking at biofouling organisms. And um, we think this is an important aspect from looking at how you're going to put a device down and operate it without having it so covered in barnacles and so on that it can't operate. But from an ecological point of view, it's a little bit difficult to see that being a problem. Other issues that have been raised include the possibility of adding islands, if you will, of, soft, of hard bottom habitat in soft bottom habitat, and could this be um, an invasive species pathway? But again, it's a pretty theoretical kind of argument at this point, because we do have, we have buoys out there, we have various other kinds of things added to the environment. So let's just go on. I want to show you this last interaction quickly. I don't know how many this really affects, um, but if you, if you worked for a water quality agency or there were worries about this, um, we think that this is something, at least for now, we have a bit of a handle on. Um, they, the concern is you'll change water flow, wave heights. There's been a lot of concern both in Northern California and the west of England that by the surfing community that the surfing will be destroyed if you put uh, uh, wave devices out there. Um, what we know at this point is if there are effects from a single device, they're way too small to measure. They're much below natural variability. As we get to large arrays, maybe we need to re-examine this. So the only tools we have right now really are numerical modeling. Um, and just to give you one particular example here, um, we've done some work actually in my shop looking at tidal turbines in Puget Sound with the idea that if you put enough turbines in, you would change water circulation, which has a lot to do with the estuarine effect. It affects sediment transport, how nutrients are distributed, perhaps uh, increases low dissolved oxygen in areas because of lower circulation and so on and so forth. And there's been a lot of these modeling efforts all over the world. Um, a number, our, our lab and several of the other national labs have tried to take it to a slightly higher level by putting more realistic turbines in the model rather than just sort of an energy sink. And However, we are still lacking validation data. We validated these hydrodynamic models really well. They're really very accurate, but it's putting these devices in the water that, are, that is sort of the new piece. And in this particular case, this is uh, the map of Puget Sound on the left, and the bright red is where there's very fast tidal movement. And if you look towards the bottom, there's a little red streak there at Tacoma Narrows. Anyone who knows the area knows this is a very fast moving bit of water. There's a bridge over it. And what we uh, did was put in um, 10 meter turbines, uh, 10 meters off the seabed. This, in this case, there's 20 in this particular run. Uh, we've done it with 20, 50, 100, 1,000, et cetera. And the, the right and the, the second one shows you the little dots where the turbines are. The two right-hand um, uh, uh, figures, uh, the left-hand one is the velocity deficit. And that means where the water slowed down um, uh, from the turbines. And the one on the right is uh, sort of analogous. It's how the um, uh, sediment uh, ch was changed by taking some of this energy out, changing the flow, the sediment at the, at the uh, sea floor was going to move a little slower. But what I want to note to you is how quickly this dissipates to background levels. The blue is just where there's, you know, the, the normal movement of the water. So, and if you look back to the left-hand one, you see what, what kind of area we're talking about. So, these are the kinds of tools um, that I think could be helpful.
And we have pushed at places like Admiralty Inlet up further uh, north in the Sound where you see that bright red streak. And we've gone as high as about 1,000 turbines, which no one's ever going to let you put in the water. But that's the point at which we start to see some of the breakdown of some of these sort of circulatory systems and nutrients and, and dissolved oxygen and so on and so forth. So uh, this is the kind of tool we have to help us in this. And I just wanted to sort of let you know that those kinds of things are going on. We, we and others are working on similar kinds of models for wave energy, um, uh, you know, sort of dissipation. What happens if you take a lot of wave energy off? Do you change the sedimentation along beaches, along um, uh, shoreline, erosion potential, et cetera? Okay. Um, I, uh, we've been at this for a while. I would like to spend just a few minutes showing you the framework we're thinking about, um, trying to, you know, okay, we've sort of got some sense of what kind of data is being collected out there from you and others. We're hoping to get some sense of how to better hone that, those ideas, what's still needed. But how do we put this together? How do we do something that can move the needle, move forward, making it easier for you guys to access information maybe, for developers to understand what is required of them and for them to access information. And so this is what we have uh, are proposing and, and your feedback will be very, very helpful. What we, we'd like to do is develop a common understanding of the data types and parameters that are needed to address these effects. We'd like to create a set of best practices for this collection of data. And we really want you guys to be with us to test the framework, to see if this is useful for this term data transfer, which as you've sort of seen through this is really more about how do you use existing information to inform where you're going with, with new applications, with new developments. And then we need to think through if we get some best practices for citing, for permitting, for monitoring and mitigation, how can these be sort of, you know, put forward, to implemented, have people start to use them? So the framework we're uh, thinking about consists of describing the environment and evaluating how comparable data sets could be from sort of one area to another. We've referred to these as MRE project archetypes. I'll explain that in a minute. We've tried to describe how one might apply this um, framework and we're going to have to think about how it might be implemented. So this is what where we started from. Again, with those same five interactions or stressors that I just talked with you about. And although we do think some of these are applicable with offshore wind, we're really coming from the wave and tidal, and we sort of discount collision risks for wave. Um, the, the, the whole mooring line collision is another issue we could talk about if we have time. But for now, this is how we're looking at this. And what we've done is we've developed what we've called these project archetypes. Now, if you go to the dictionary, an archetype is considered a very typical example or an imitation of an original. And we delved into the literature to look at other industries who have used this sort of idea of data transferability. We looked at uh, some of the economics literature, transportation, and ecology provides some, some um, uh, thoughts, and land use science. For example, there are a number of international programs that look at different habitats in different countries around the world and try to determine how effective restoration techniques are, and they might be mangroves to high step to something else. How can you look at some commonalities and what can you say from one area to another? So from this, we developed these, what we call these archetypes. And what we've said is that if you have a like archetype, you have the highest possibility of using data from one, you know, location to another or potential for data transferability. We've defined these archetypes using four different variables. First of all, the stressor, which is that interaction things I was talking about, acoustics, EMF, et cetera. We've described it by the site conditions, by the technology type, and by the receptor group. A receptor to us in the stressor receptor terminology, the receptors would be the animals, the habitats, et cetera. And so as an example, the one I've picked here is actually a tidal turbine. 
um, but I think it, it follows for any of the others. The stressor we're picking for this example is collision risk. The site conditions is it's a tidal channel that's shallow and narrow. The, tech, the specific tidal technology is some kind of a bottom-based tidal device, and tidal devices come in both those sitting on the bottom and also floating ones that might be at the surface or subsurface, so this is a bottom-based one. And the receptor we're concerned about here is marine mammals. And we consider those four descriptors making up an, up an archetype. So that's our project archetype in this case. And we've tried to work through what, for these five stressors, what are all those archetypes that make sense? This is the one for collision. And if you think of, so it's, it's collision is our stressor throughout here. If you think of site conditions, tidal channels are either shallow and narrow, or they tend to be wider and deeper in order to get the kind of flow you need for, for tidal energy. And the technologies are likely to be either bottom-based, bottom-mounted, or in the water column. Um, and our receptors are marine mammals, fish, diving birds. You could add sea turtles, I suppose, but not very much in tidal areas. We've defined, uh, we've had to make some choices. We've called shallow channels being less than 40 meters deep, narrow channels being less than two kilometers wide. So we've made some choices there, just, you know sort of looking at what we've seen around the world. So if you played all this out for collision risk, there'd be 22 archetypes. We've done the same for noise. Uh, the two site conditions being a sort of an isolated or quiet environment, that is less than 80 decibels of an ambient noise, and a more noisy environment being more than 80 decibels. The technologies generally are just tidal or wave devices because the sound output from a wave or a tidal device depends a little less on the, um, uh, the structure of it because most of the sound is coming from the power takeoff um, units, the generators. And then we considered the animals at risk to be marine mammals and fish. To our knowledge, those are the only marine organisms who really can be bothered by sound. And of course, not all fish really are, are, uh, are very noise oriented. So that, that amounts to eight archetypes. We go on with EMF, where the site conditions we thought about buried cables or else cables laid on the seafloor. You could have shielded or unshielded cables. In terms of the te specific technologies, they're mostly seafloor cables, although you might have draped cables. For example, if you had floating wave devices or floating wind devices, you would have inter-array cables, those cables that are sort of, you know, daisy-chained one to another, and they would be going through the water column. And they are pretty much always unshielded because they can't take the weight of the shielding. Uh, the same is true if you have a, um, a cable that goes from the device all the way down to the seafloor. You generally cannot shield those cables until they get to the seafloor. Then in terms of receptors, we have the various elasma bank species. We also have a series of invertebrates. So if you play that out, it's 10 archetypes. You're seeing the pattern here. In terms of habitat change being the, the concern, we think in terms of hard bottom or soft bottom, and also what could go on in the water column. For the hard and soft bottom um, habitats, the technologies that would affect those habitats are either foundations or anchor lines, you know, et cetera. If you were in the water column, however, and you had floats or mooring lines, this could also be a change in habitat. On the bottom, benthic invertebrates, fish that are either uh, demersal or they're shoaling around device, around structures in the water. If you get to the water column, you may have marine mammals and sea turtles who could potentially be at risk from things like floats and mooring lines, as well as the fish. And then finally, the physical systems. Um, we tend to think that these devices would be in either an enclosed basin, like a tidal basin, or an open coast, which is more likely to be a wave, or, or in the case of that's where offshore wind would be, not in a very enclosed space, generally. 
and sediment transport and changes to water quality in the food web are the possible sort of end uh, ecosystem processes that could be affected. And that amounts to four archetypes. Okay, so we've done all that. So why and what would we do with this if we, if we could sort of describe all that and place all the existing data sets somewhere in one of these archetypes? What would we do with that? Well, we tried to think about how you would use this. And we think if you are going to use data from one study, one location to another, it has to be the same Marine Renewable Energy Project archetype. It's got to be, if it's a tidal um, project, it's got to be from the same sort of kinds of environment. It's got to be a tidal basin, a similar sort of technology, et cetera. We think you need the same receptor species or somewhat closely related. For example, if you're concerned with marine mammals and you have data on large whales, it doesn't really tell you anything about sea lions, pinnipeds. But if you had two, if you had a species of corpa, two species of corpus, you might be able to glean more information from one study to another. So you had a porpoise, harbor porpoise in one case and a bottlenose porpoise in another. Could you compare those? We think having a similar technology, and by this I don't mean wave, tidal, or wind, but a specific maybe manufacturer or it's a three-bladed tidal turbine or it's a point absorber wave device. And in the case of wind, that most of the technologies have sort of converged, so that helps. But you would probably, you would not want to compare bottom-based um, offshore wind effects with floating offshore wind effects. We think it's preferred that it's a similar wave and tidal or wind resource, that there's just some similarities in terms of the kinds of stresses that are likely to be there, the sorts of, um, of wind bands, shall we say, if it was wind. And even it would be nice to have them in close geographical proximity. So you have some sense it's sort of the same, the same biogeographic region. But we've tried to think of this hierarchically, starting at the top, that we think you absolutely have to have the same marine renewable um, energy project archetype. But it's nice to have the same technology, and it would be great to have the close geographical proximity. But maybe it becomes not quite as critical as you go down that scale. So that's it. Uh, we'd love to know, I whipped through that kind of fast, but I hope you got sort of the sense of what we're talking about. Because what we're thinking is that if we can create this as sort of a large matrix, hopefully an online searchable tool, would it be helpful to you to have a framework like this? Does this hierarchy we've put together make sense? Do you, and, and then each of those, sorry, I stopped that thought. If we created this in a big matrix, each available data set worldwide could be sort of tagged of where it falls in that archetype, in that type of technology, et cetera, so that it would be possible if you had a particular archetype to go in and search for what else is available in that archetype. Would this be useful to you? Do you think you'd use it? And what else should we be doing or doing differently? Okay, well, if there's no other immediate thoughts, I just wanted to tell you sort of what, what we're doing with this, and where we're moving towards. We are doing these meetings and, and workshops largely here in the U.S., so we're going to do a few abroad and, and work with our other countries in uh, Annex 4 to see how this really works. This is, you know, the U.S. is our big guinea pig because we think that there's many things really on the cusp of happening here, but, but um, we like to think we're thinking through some of these processes, in some cases more, more uh, uh, stepwise than some of the other countries. We're going to gather all this feedback together. We're going to make modifications to what you've seen, especially the framework and how we use this information. And then we'll be holding a workshop around the International Conference on Ocean Energy in June. It's in France. And that will bring more, the, more of the um, developers and researchers together to really share what we've learned so far. We are starting to write some best practices that we would like to vet through your group, but also we'll be taking to the workshop and reporting out later in 2018. And as I mentioned, we, we hadn't originally planned, but we really see that this moving towards some kind of web-based tool might be useful. 
unless anyone has anything else, I just want to really thank you for taking the time, taking the focus, providing some really great feedback, and I'm hoping we'll hear some more from you uh, once you get this survey. Um, and anything that you'd like to send us or questions you'd like, please, there's our contact information.